Before I invite our expert panel, let me introduce the Avoidable Deaths Network or ADN briefly. So we can move to the next slide. Thank you. ADN is a diverse, dynamic, inclusive, and global membership network of experts, practitioners, and researchers interested in avoiding human deaths from natural hazards, naturally triggered technological hazards, and human-made hazards in low- and middle-income countries. ADN was launched in 2019 at the fourth summit of the Global Alliance for Disaster Risk Institute in Kyoto in Japan. The next slide. We are often misunderstood as an NGO. Now, ADN is not an NGO. ADN is based and led by the universities of Leicester in the UK and Kansai in, in Japan. Uh, ADN is actually a joint enterprise and it is implemented in collaboration with regional coordinators across the globe. Leicester University offers a flexible learning MSc in risk, crisis and disaster management, and I am the program director. And Kansai University offers a BA and BSc in safety science. So to learn more about these programs, please feel free to visit our website or feel free to email me. So what is the purpose of Avoidable Deaths Network? So ADN's purpose is to inform policymakers, practitioners, and researchers to make better decisions, to save lives and reduce injuries to achieve sustainable development. Our purpose is aligned with the United Nations uh, Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction's first two global targets. So we can move to the next one, and target A and target B. The target A is about reducing the global disaster mortality by 2030, including drowning deaths during disasters. And target B is about reducing the number of people affected by disasters by 2030. Now these targets work in alignment with several sustainable development goals. Last year, ADN has been selected to be part of the United Nations Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction's Voluntary Commitment Platform. So we can move to the next one. So what do we do to achieve our purpose? So currently we are doing six interrelated activities. Uh, given the constraint of time, I shan't go through the details of the activities that we do, but I think for this session, the first two activities are very important. Number one is fostering transdisciplinary ideas, partnerships and solutions. And second is raising the visibility of these two targets through special sessions, which are delivered uh, virtually and free of cost. We can move to the next one. So we launched the first special session on avoidable deaths on 4th December 2020 at the International Conference on Geographical Science for Resilient Communities at Makarere University in Uganda. Today's special session is the 10th special session and we will deliver three more special sessions this year. The aims and objectives of our special sessions are basically twofold. The first is that they are knowledge sharing and engagement webinars. We deliver them virtually to the public for free with the aim to raise awareness on the concept of avoidable debts and their avoidance through theoretical or and practical solutions, sometimes both. Second, the aim is to raise awareness on those debts that are not, that are often not in the mainstream. For instance, our previous special sessions have raised awareness on debts from nutritional crisis from dog bites, snake bites, scavenging. And today's special session focuses on drowning deaths. We can move to the next slide, thank you. So you, you can join ADN, you can follow ADN through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. Also you can look up the updates of Avoidable Deaths Network through the UNDRR Sendai Voluntary Commitment Platform. Um, you have the link up on the slide and also, if you would like to join ADN, we have the link there. And one of my colleagues is going to drop the link on the chat box. So thank you very much. And our first keynote speaker is Dr. Aminur Rahman. It's an absolute privilege to have Aminur Bhai today to open the special session on this very special day. So Dr. Aminur Rahman is the director of the International Drowning Research Center. This research center is part of the Center for Injury Prevention, Health Development and Research Bangladesh. In short, it is called 
CIPRV. Dr. Rahman has developed and implemented childhood drowning prevention programs for rural Bangladesh, and he is internationally renowned for his contribution in this field of injury prevention. So, Amir Bhai, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nivedita. Alex, uh, can you actually <clears throat> start my uh, presentation? Okay, thank you. Mm. So, can, can you go to the previous one? The first one, the first slide. Okay. So the title is CIPRB's Leadership in Drowning Prevention and its Past, Present, and Future Initiatives in Bangladesh. So I, I'll try to explain why I was I was leveling it as a CIPRB's leadership. Thank you. Move on to the next one, please. So if we we see the milestones of drowning prevention in Bangladesh, it's it's not a very uh long ago rather in last if we calculate the 17 years we have been working it before 2005 nobody in bangladesh were aware that drowning is such a big problem uh, in bangladesh and from there we actually started so in 2005 uh, we we learned the magnitude and risk factors of drowning and then from then we started doing different research work to understand uh, the or identify the effective interventions. So since 2005 or six to till date, actually, we are continuing a different intervention programs. The first one you see, uh, which was evaluated in, in 2010 was precise. Then we did Bangladesh um, Atoll and Swim Safe program. And after that, uh, we, we conducted um, saving of lives from drowning and was evaluated in 2005, 15. And then uh, from uh, 2017, 18 and 19, we conducted our Bhasha. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a, another drowning prevention research work, which we conducted only in our Southern district of Bangladesh. and and. Tom Micro is from RNLI who actually provided uh, that we got the fund from RNLI. And from 2015, actually, uh, during 2014, you know, uh, we the identified interventions uh, from Bangladesh were incorporated in the global report on drowning prevention of WHO. And uh, various uh, advocacy work actually started uh, in Bangladesh, around Bangladesh, or in the in the in the other parts of the globe using uh, Bangladeshi interventions. And and the result of that, we we got the UN resolution in drowning prevention, and uh, and that's why today we are talking on drowning prevention, and we are expecting that by this year the government of bangladesh especially the minister of health will 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 we'll finalize and publish the drowning prevention strategy for bangladesh and during this year in 2020 the ministry of women and children affair has taken the largest project in terms of money uh, in bangladesh and and probably it's not only in bangladesh uh, the, the project size it probably in the globe and that is uh, it's an integrated child drowning and child development project uh, so this is in short about the milestones of uh, different drowning prevention activities and the results of those activities can you move on to the next slide alex so uh, we know the global magnitude but uh, many of you may not know the magnitude of drowning in bangladesh so in 2016, CIPRB, with the support of DGHS, did uh, one of the largest uh, survey uh, in covering uh, a, a, a representative sample of, of population of the country. More than 300,000 population we actually interviewed. And through that, we found that in Bangladesh, uh, each year, over 19,000 people drown. Among them, uh, 14,500 are under 18. If we calculate it per day, which is 40 per day. And if we consider under five children, that, that will constitute 
10,000 per year, that is 30 children a day. So can you move on to the next one? Okay. Bangladesh Demographic and Health Survey, this is a government survey not done by CIPRB. We see that children one to four, five years, the number one cause of death in this age group is drowning and 58% of the children of this age die due to drowning. After that, that is pneumonia or, or other, uh, other intervention, uh, other, other causes. Can you move on to the next? Okay. Why does children drown? In uh, especially under five children, we found that that about two thirds of the drowning takes place either in the ponds or in the ditches. So, and these are not too far from the children's house. When does children drown? Ch a child drown. Normally, it is in the daylight hours from six o'clock in the morning to six o'clock in the afternoon. And more specifically from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. when mothers are busy with their household chores and father is, uh, is out of home for work, elder siblings has gone to school. During that time, about 60% of the children down. Can I move on to the next? And what are the, what are the factors associated with the childhood drowning? You know, Bangladesh is the land of rivers, you know, um, several rivers intersect the country and their, uh, their tributaries. And apart from the rivers, there are numerous ponds, ditches and everything. And so people are very much exposed, even the children are exposed to the water. And I mentioned that 80% of the drowning actually occur within 20 meters from the house. People are not much aware that drowning causes so much, so much death. And, and uh, there is lack of supervision, of, especially for the young children. And I mentioned that from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., about 60% of the children drown, basically due to lack of supervision. There's lack of certain essential skills like swimming skills, rescue skills, first aid skills. And finally, even uh, the hospital management of a drowning patient or a drowning person is not very satisfying. There is no structured protocol to manage a drowning case. Next, please. <clears throat> so in 2005, we saw this chart and actually understood that what should be done to prevent drowning. You know, the, when the a child um, reaches his first birthday, is a it become vulnerable to drowning. So from first year of life is the most vulnerable time. And with the increase of age, drowning decreases. So about 80% of drowning actually happen below five years of age. But we can see that the, 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 in other age groups, there is still some drowning. So, and, and we found that uh, in a subset of sample, we, we wanted to know what is the extent of swimming ability of the children. And we found that there is a reciprocal relationship between the drowning death and the swimming ability. With the increase of age, swimming ability increases and the drowning rate decreases. And this actually gave us a clue that if you can teach children swimming after the age of five or six, then a large number of deaths of children who are more than five years could also be saved and children below five years need to be properly supervised. Next, please. <clears throat> so uh, we did a lot of research from 2005 to actually till death. So it is hardly to remember to mention all difficult uh, by this time to, to describe each and every research work. But I should mention the precise, which was funded by UNICEF, solid, which is the saving of lives from drowning has been funded by Bloomberg Philanthropies, uh, along with Johns Hopkins University. Bangladesh Atoll and Swim Safe Project was funded by Canadian um, the, the Grand Challenges Canada. Actually, I missed one, which is uh, RLSS uh, Australia also funded to work uh, some of the drowning prevention activities. And finally, we are now working in Basha project 
uh, with, with uh, the support of RNLI. All these interventions suggest that children uh, below five years should be kept in, in the atoll and, uh, and this is 80% um, uh, protective and children who are six to 10 years should be swim safe, uh, which is 90%. Uh, teaching ch children survival swimming is 90% protective. Move on to the next slide, please. So this is another, which is, uh, which is uh, first responder training for the adolescents and adults, which uh, we found that 90% of the community people can learn this skill and utilize during uh, when it is required. Next one, please. So global involvement, you know, CIPRB has been involved in providing technical support to various nations to conduct national survey, including Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, Cambodia, and recently India. We also provided support uh, to the uh, other nations like Vietnam and Nepal to implement the intervention. We had also contributed in knowledge sharing by publishing paper and also writing books and also uh, you know, in the global report of drowning prevention. Next one, please. In the national level, we we we, we supported uh, Minister of Women and Children Affairs. We are actually this program has been recently launched, and also we uh, we CIPRB is supporting to develop the drowning prevention strategy to the government, and uh, to some extent, uh, CIPRB uh, with RNLI. Is, is actually involved in, in this event resolution and global drowning prevention. Next slide, please. So our future plan is to continue research to generate more evidence for effective intervention, capacity development in conducting research and implementing drowning prevention, provide support to government to scale up the drowning prevention program throughout the country and strengthen national and international network for drowning prevention. Next. Next, please. And that's all from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aminur Bhai. That was absolutely fantastic. The work that CIPRB has done, and I think you have encapsulated the trajectory since 2005 up until 2022 and beyond. And the evidence-based work, the interventions, the implementations and evaluation, and all of those coming to an informing policy level to influence not just nationally but internationally it's a stellar performance so all the best wishes to ciprv to continue shining globally so our next speaker thank is much. thank you Aminur Bhai. so our next speaker is dr colin saunders so it's an absolute pleasure again to introduce dr colin so dr colin saunders is a senior lecturer in emergency medicine at the university of cape town in south africa she convenes the Scientific Advisory Board for Drowning Prevention with Life Saving South Africa, a non-profit organization. Her primary research interests are injury epidemiology and prevention, most specifically that of drowning, as well as research management and priority setting. So Dr. Saunders, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. I really do appreciate the invite. Um, and I think uh, this talk is really just to give a very, very quick look into how um, uh, specifically COVID and climate change is likely to affect our work in drowning prevention over the next um, sort of future period. <clears throat> so I've, because I think what we've learned since the start of COVID is that uh, future casting is very difficult. I've specifically called my, my talk, um, uh, how to keep our head above water during uncertain times. If we could go to the next slide, please. I think many on this call will um, already know about the burden of, of drowning globally, but we know that uh, about 90% of drowning deaths occur in low and middle income countries and the African region in particular um, <clears throat> has very high drowning risk compared to, to many other regions. In South Africa, we have a drowning fatality rate of about three per 100,000. That equates to about 1,500 deaths every year. But we know that this is under-recognized because it doesn't account for transport-related injuries. It doesn't account for non-fatal drowning, which from other regions we know can be anywhere between 1 to 4 and 1 to 10 as a ratio to fatal drownings. 
Um, and it also doesn't account for extreme weather-related drowning fatalities. Um, so I think we, we recognize that drowning is a problem, but we certainly recognize that it um, is, that the burden is much higher than the official numbers. And in my next slide, um, you'll see that South Africa um, has a, what we call a quadruple burden of disease. So we have these four kind of colliding epidemics. This is a, a figure that was presented by the South African Medical Research Council uh, a number of years ago. But we have very high rates of infectious diseases, um, complications of maternal uh, and newborn and child health, a uh, growing burden of non-communicable diseases, and then a very high burden of violence and injury. But even within violence and injury, um, the, the two main contributors there, which are um, personal, uh, interpersonal violence and road traffic crashes, both of those have rates that are about 10 times higher than the drowning fatality rates in South Africa. And so it's very hard to position drowning as a priority um, when you're kind of competing against these other quite big burdens in a, a bigger picture of healthcare burdens. Um, COVID has had a really, a very real impact on the South African economy as well. So we had a hard lockdown period right at the beginning um, of the, the COVID pandemic. Um, and this had a huge effect on our economy. So many, uh, much of our, our workforce, um, and we already had very high rates of unemployment before um, COVID, but much of our workforce was very casual labor um, that were not protected during this time. Uh, and so unemployment rates soared, um, poverty increased uh, immensely, and we haven't recovered from that as a country. So what this has meant is that there is less money for investment um, in the private sector um, and in the public sector. Um, you know, there was obviously a lot of refocusing of budget and, and um, resources around the response to COVID, understandably. Um, but even before COVID, we've kind of had this um, uh, uh, large competition for, for a low number of resources as well. And so drowning prevention tends to fall quite low on the, the general resourcing agenda. Um, and that's probably even worse now after um, COVID. Um, if you move into the next slide. <clears throat> so what a... a um, weakened economy, the, one of the effects of a weakened economy is um, even higher rates of inequality in the country and poverty. So many of you, the figure on the top right, will recognize that um, from a, the cover of a Time magazine many years ago that shows the, the stark inequality in South Africa. And so you have green leafy suburbs with some beautiful blue swimming pools on one side of, of literally a, a road, and on the other side is an informal settlement with very high rates of poverty. Those are shacks, um, very high density, no infrastructure, no public services. And we are seeing more and more, uh, you can go back, sorry. Um, we are seeing more and more that, um, the, that the, the downturn in the economy has forced people into kind of more informal, high density um, living. Um, and this has had a, a knock-on effect on uh, drowning risk, but also on resources available to deal with drowning. And as we move into, uh, well, not move, as we start to recognize the effects of climate change as well, um, we know that drowning is, a, is inextricably linked to development. And so the um, decreasing economy that has impacts on infrastructure and, and our ability to maintain it, um, it has impacts on urbanization, um, increased vulnerability of different populations, and obviously extreme weather events as well. And those extreme weather events um, are, impact these vulnerable communities much more than they do the green leafy suburbs um, of Johannesburg across the road. And so I think that COVID, um, and particularly the... the um, kind of the economic effects of COVID is colliding with the, the long-term impacts of climate change to both increase drowning risk in our country and also to, um, to kind of uh, strain the resources um, and, and mean that there is less, less funding, less investment in drowning prevention. 
So my next slide, um, I, I'd i like to, so I, I, I realise that uh, this has maybe been a bit of a pessimistic 10 minute presentation, but um, the WHO has called this year for us to do one thing to prevent drowning. And I think um, what I have, what I'd like to leave you with is the one thing is to try and think about how we can shift the, the thinking and the mindset around drowning. Um, and I think often, you know, even within the spaces that I often work in within life saving and sea rescue, and um, we tend to think about drowning in the, the sort of the top left picture of, of children drowning in swimming pools or at the beach. We think of pool c covers and, and nets and fences and lifeguards as the, the solution. And, and I'm not saying that they aren't. In many cases, um, they are. But I think in more parts of the world, drowning doesn't look like that. Um, you know, drowning looks like children bathing and washing in a river um, and that river coming down in flood and washing out people that live on the flood plains. Um, and so I think if we can think of one thing to do for World Drowning Prevention Day this year is to try and, and step out of our silos. So for those of us in the drowning prevention or injury prevention space is to think about how we can take drowning out of um, this kind of small bubble of drowning prevention and think about the intersection with other agendas, uh, specifically those that have strong political backing. So we have to look at how um, drowning intersects with the sustainable development goals, particularly 3, 6 and 13. I think we can find strong um, parallels there. And those that are not in the drowning prevention space, if you are here and kind of have come to this talk from a different injury space or a different sector, I'd like to encourage others to think about how drowning um, risk is actually um, part of you know, what they do and what they address as well. So if you are um, working in the climate change space to, to kind of, I encourage you to think about drowning prevention um, and drowning and what you can do, what one thing you can do um, in your space to actually bring drowning in and give it higher priority. Um, because even though it is um, perhaps smaller um, than some other agendas or some other issues, that doesn't mean, you know, for those two and a half million people that have died from drowning over the last decade, um, it's still something very, very real and something very important. And I think we as a community need to make sure that we step out um, and try to, to highlight the issue of drowning and its parallels with other agendas. Thank you, Evadita. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Saunders. That's so reflective and critical. But I think there are a few takeaways for me. I just really like the way you brought the intersectionality of poverty, vulnerability, climate change, climate-related hazards. And also, I think it is so interesting because my understanding, a little bit of understanding, a little bit of review that I have done last year, I thought that drowning is a rural phenomena. But I think from your findings, it is also an urban phenomena, you know, based on informal urbanization, lack of resources and various other things. So I think the intersectionality is so key. And also your call to think outside the silos for the traditional epidemiologists and injury prevention is well taken. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. So our next speaker is another giant absolute giant. It's an absolute pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Olive Kubusinge. Dr. Olive um, is an accident and emergency surgeon and injury epidemiologist. She is a senior research fellow at Makerere University School of Public Health in Uganda. She heads the Trauma, Injury and Disability Unit at Makerere she is a distinguished fellow of the George Institute for Global Health Australia. She is the board chair of the Road Traffic Injury Research Network, an international agency working to improve road safety. So it's an absolute pleasure to have Dr. Uh, Olive um, on board and give us her talk. So Dr. Olive, over to you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Nibidita, and it is um, a privilege for me to speak at this uh, special session. Um, and, and also to follow the two presenters that have uh, spoken, because I think that what we are speaking to is, is going to be um, seen to be, uh, to come together. Um, so I am speaking at drowning while at work. Has COVID-19 changed anything? Um, and I think from listening to Colleen right now and, and hearing the very different type, you know, different circumstances in which people drown, uh, swimming pools and, and uh, overflowing rivers. And then thinking about people that are drowning, maybe fetching water or, or swimming and people at work. So if I could have the next slide, please. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to use an example from Canada. In 2018, we concluded here um, a survey, a national survey on drowning. And our objectives were to uh, try and get a handle on the burden of drowning, but also to have a good understanding of the circumstances in which people drown. So uh, the results showed that boating uh, is a very uh, high risk uh, and that in fact 50% of those that drown um, in Uganda are uh, engaged in boating and that of those that, that are boating, you know, close to 70% of them are fishing and another 25% are traveling, quite often traveling as a part of trade uh, on the water. Um, and you know, most of these would be young people, uh, ages in their 20s and early 30s. Uh, and as you, you can see, they'd be using small vessels, you know, robots, canoes, um, and um, maybe other fishing, small fishing and transportation boats. So this one would say is data that is specific to Uganda. If I could have the next slide, please. So, so this was before COVID-19. But the story that I'd like to tell this afternoon is, um, is from a specific part of Uganda. And as you can see, Uganda is well endowed with, with water, with large lakes, small lakes, plenty of rivers. But I'd like to focus on this part of Western Uganda around Lake Albert. Lake Albert is a beautiful crater lake um, that straddles the, the border between the Democratic Republic of Congo on one side and Uganda on the other side. And so the communities that live around the lake and that live off the lake um, are on both sides of the border. And they actually would cross you know, back and forth um, without much regard to the imaginary line that runs that separates the two countries. So these are fishing, mostly fishing communities that derive their livelihoods uh, from the lake. Now, in early 2020, when the pandemic was declared, um, literally overnight, um, Uganda um, imposed a lockdown, a serious lockdown, trans public transportation shut down, um, fishing on the lakes, fishing on this and other lakes was shut down initially for 30 days and it was extended. And in fact, between immigration uh, security services and public health, they forcibly moved communities that lived on the upper parts of the lake and brought them into the lower parts where they could presumably be um, more closely monitored. And, and this was also that they could protect the people from the virus so that um, people that might be crossing over from the Congo into the Ugandan waters and onto the Ugandan shores um, might be prevented from mixing with the Ugandans and so um, maybe not bringing the virus across. So literally overnight, these people that had that lived on the lake and that had their li entire livelihoods on the lake lost their incomes, lost their sources of food. They were forcibly moved, and uh, and and as yeah, so they didn't have any incomes and they didn't have any ways of acquiring food. So as we can see in the next slide, uh, after a short while, we started getting these reports of increased drownings, boat capsizes on the lakes. And some of these were happening uh, as people were being forced to move from one part of the lake to the other. But there was also something else happening is that when you force people whose livelihoods depend on the lake, for instance, they're going to have to find some other way to survive. Um, and so 
uh, from the, uh, having lost their livelihoods, a lot of um, property was drowned in the lake as people were trying to get away from um, enforcement services, we started to, to hear of other things. If I could see the next slide, please. So, so these, these communities that were escaping the virus were beginning to confront the lake in some other ways. So there was increased un unregulated and illegal fishing, as you might imagine, uh, once those areas that were regularly fished and, and monitored by marine services, as they were being cleared of all um, legal fishing, the fishing community had to find some ways to survive. So they were then now finding alternatives using more irregular vessels, um, improvising in some ways, and then fishing from areas that they knew to be unsafe, but they would be away from surveillance. They would be away from security surveillance. Um, and as you might have noticed in my first slide, there's very little use of life jackets. But now even that little was gone because the fishermen realized that if you have a life jacket on, then you attract attention from security. And so, once the lockdowns were imposed and once all these regulations came into force, then the same people that were being protected from the virus were actually being um, forced to go into more unsafe use of the lake. And so um, we understood that there were some undocumented drownings, either little boats um, improvisation and they were capsizing or people were using some other ways to try and get across the lake um, and they were drownings. Now this um, is a story from um, maybe from where most of you are from a remote corner of Uganda, but actually this is not unique to Uganda. This um, happened in many other places where um, artisan fishing is happening, where communities that are dependent on rivers, on lakes for their livelihoods, those livelihoods were taken away by policies that were probably well-meaning, but um, not taking sufficient regard for the, the livelihoods of the people that rely on the water. So then we begin to think about, so if I could have the next slide, please. So some of you, all of you, I'm sure, <laughs> will see 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and, and immediately recall the the um, UN resolution that brought in the World uh, Drowning Prevention Day. And in its first paragraph, it actually recalls, so that was um, UN resolution 75 slash 273. And it uses the first paragraph to recall um, UN resolution 70 slash one, which was the resolution that articulated the sustainable development goals. Um, and, and in that paragraph, it, it talks about its recognition that eradicating poverty in all its forms and dimensions is the greatest global challenge. And its commitment to achieving sustainable development in its three dimensions, economic, social, and environmental, in a balanced and integrated manner to building upon the achievements of the MDGs and seeking to address their unfinished business and to leaving no one behind. So if we think about these communities, if we think about the example that I just gave of fishing communities that had lived on the, um, on the lake, on the Lake Albert, and that in, in a couple of days, you know, without regard for their economic, social and environmental concerns, they were moved away from where, you know, from their living spaces. They were shut down in terms of, uh, of livelihoods, of economy, of, of earnings. Uh, then we, we realized that uh, in some ways that, that would not pass for what we would be saying, leaving no one behind. So I'd like to reflect on this and, and point out two things about drowning prevention is first of all, our dependence on local data if we are to make a difference. So for instance, listening to, to 
to the you know the presentation from Bangladesh and realizing how very different it is from Uganda is that if we want to make an impact in any place, we are going to rely on local data to know the right thing to do. And that if once we understand the circumstances um, in this location, then we'll be better able to deal with it. The second point that I'd like to reflect upon is the multi-sectoral uh, impact. For instance, there was security, there was public health, there was uh, immigration, there could have been education. And all of these, po the policies that come out of those sectors have a huge impact on whether people's uh, risk of drowning increases or reduces. So I'd like to, um, to, I guess, make the appeal that as we go into looking at different countries and how they approach drowning prevention and realizing that we need all these multiple sectors. So we look at our policies and say, regardless of where the policy is coming from, let us pay attention to the economic, the social and the environmental concerns of these communities. Otherwise, we won't be leaving them behind. We'll actually be leaving them dead in the water. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Absolutely fascinating story. So I think the takeaways for me, I just, I'm always fascinated by causes and circumstances of direct and indirect debt. You know, so I think the numbers, the risks at risk population, the presentations that we have um, heard from Dr. Aminur and Dr. Collins, but I think your story is so profoundly human. You know, it is the story of the fishers and the fishermen's lives and livelihoods around the Lake Albert. And it's absolutely fascinating. fascinating. And the other thing that you mentioned, uh, which I have written down, uh, is that about the, that we need to understand the circumstances, the local circumstances. It is the local circumstances will, in a way, generate innovative solutions. And it is through innovative solutions that are based on context-specific evidence, we will be able to identify solutions to reduce drowning. So drowning is an occupational hazard in the context of Uganda, which is so different what we heard from Colin and Dr. Aminu. And finally, the multi-sectoral approach. So the drowning cross-cuts so many sectors and governance is the heart of it. And governance is something that I have been working on for the past 10 years. So fascinating presentation, a different side of drowning as, as an occupational risk, occupational hazard, which brings health and safety, governance, multi-sector, and also sustainable development goals at the heart of uh, injury prevention. Thank you so much, Dr. Olive. So finally, we have Judy. So it's again a brilliant, it's an absolute pleasure to invite Judy Irma Sete. I have worked with her for the Drowning Project, which was funded by Royal National Lifeboat Institution. So it's an absolute pleasure to introduce Judy. So Judy works for Norwich City Council as a community, community conversation officer, promoting community development and resilience. She is a WASH consultant and British Red Cross Norfolk Emergency Response Volunteer. As I mentioned that this project was funded by Royal National Life Food Institutions and we have recently concluded this project uh, and I would like to invite Judy to present the findings of our project. So Judy, over to you. Lauren, do we have Judy? Judy is there. Yes. So Judy, the floor is yours. Is there a technical problem? Ah, there's a problem with the audio. You give a few more minutes, maybe a minute or two. So Judy, if you could. Um... So Tom, what would you suggest? Shall we move on to the next one? 
and yeah. then once we yeah okay thank you so much okay let us do that so we'll bring our ADN's leaders so Hideyuki will be uh, introducing um, our junior leader and our future leader and I'll I'll resume my um, introduction to our to to Judy later on so uh, Hideyuki over to you thank you thank you very much so Thank you very much, Aloy, for complimenting our future leaders. And Dr. Olive, I've also read your comment on the chat box. Yes, Orkonol is very special. He joined ADN when he was 10 years of age mm -hmm. and is becoming more active. So we are very privileged to have such a brilliant mind, young, fresh, and he has um, lots of dreams, yeah? <laughs> lots of dreams to change the world. So we need dreamers to achieve uh, such brilliant goals. So I hope Judy, your um, speaker is working. So can we have you on the screen, please? And maybe try your mic a bit. We can't, so Judy, we can't hear you. Okay, so if that doesn't work out, so Tom, maybe we could uh, probably do the Q and A. What do you think? What would you like to suggest the way forward? So Hello? I know. Can, might... can you hear me? Oh, he's here. Oh, okay, brilliant! Hooray! So we have yeah. Judy. So <laughs> thank you very much, Judy. So please, the floor is yours. Give us your presentation. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so hello. I'm sorry about all the the difficulties, but we are here. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, uh, I'd like to present uh, on behalf of the uh, RNLI, EMIDO, CIPRB, UEA Water Security Research Center and University of Leicester. So I'll be talking about a project we completed in March this year on understanding the impact of climate change and drowning risk in Bangladesh and Tanzania. And uh, I really appreciate that um, I'm speaking actually after Colleen, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Colleen, Dr. Rahman, and Dr. Olive and Rachel, because that just ties up um, uh, the research that we did. Um, it just helps explain many things, actually, many uh, issues. So um, just about RNLI, many people do not understand RNLI's drowning risk, um, are, are not aware of RNLL's uh, drowning risk reduction programs outside the UK. And um, so it was interesting to, to be able to research the Bangladesh, um, their Bangladesh risk reduction, um, which is um, luckily um, Dr. Rahman has spoken about Bangladesh. And this is the community daycare for preschool children, survival swimming lessons for school aged children, and rescue and response training for key adults in communities. And in Tanzania, it's lifeboating training for fishers, co-designing co buoyancy products and strengthening fishers governance to include occupational safety. Uh, due to the high incidence of drowning in specific po populations in these countries, the project sought to understand uh, how climate change might impact on RNL and RNLI's programs between now and 2040. Please just put the other, the, go back one slide, please. So we examined data from literature reviews, informat discussions with in-country experts, including Water Aid Tanzania, and secondary data analysis to examine the interaction of the project implications of climate change with other risk dynamics. However, there are limitations in the projections for climate modeling. As you can imagine, it's very difficult to get the exact um, information. It's usually just regional information. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, as you can see, oh, sorry, one back, please, yeah. As you can see by the show of upward arrows, both Bangladesh and Tanzania show significant climate changes by 2040, increases in average temperatures, high intensity rainfall events, human exposure to river and coastal floods, and to 
intense cyclone cyclones is likely and possible in both countries. In Bangladesh, displacement from low-lying areas likely in the south due to sea level rise, uh, a twofold increase in disaster in in induced displacements. This is based on figures for 2010 to 2018. And, and also a five-fold increase in disaster-induced displacements for Tanzania. This is based on figures for 2014 to 2019. Next slide, please. So we used um, a table of key drowning risk factors. Uh, we looked at using an interactive workshop to categorize risk factors into broad workshop, into broad themes and qualitatively evaluated the, the livelihood, the likelihood of risk factors uh, to increase and, and their consequences for drowning. So on the screen here, you can see the red color indicates factors we considered very likely or almost certain to increase and which have high consequences for, drown, for drowning. So you can see here, living, pro living in proximity to water, extreme weather events, children under five years old, lack of supervision, uh, and also population growth and migration and displacement is likely to, to, to cause um, high drowning risk factors. Next slide, please. So the qualitative uh, exercise using this risk of assessment met matrices um, aided the discussion uh, of relative importance of climate change effects on drowning risks and program activities uh, prior to, during, and after a workshop with RNLI staff and other experts. So through this process, of independent research and expert elicitation. The team offered a set summary uh, of connections between climate change and drowning risk factors. Those considered uh, most significant are shown here in the proximate, proximal um, risk factors, uh, in intermediate, and uh, contextual risk factors. So I'll just focus on the lack of supervision for young children, uh, just because of the time we have. So climate change is very likely to increase stress in low-income family, families by exacerbating livelihood in, insecurities. And this increasing, increases their working hours and increasing illnesses um, injury and deaths from poor safety or work practices. So combined with extreme weather events, any of these factors may reduce parental capacity to supervise young children and protect them from drowning risks. Uh, next slide, please. So in conclusion to our findings, uh, climate change should be factored into drowning risk reduction policies and interventions in both countries. So the rationale for RNLI and their in-country partners projects uh, needs to continue and impacts on some additional groups should be monitored. And also we, we, we also recommended a multi-sectorial holistic approach. Uh, just to give an example, just to build on what, um, on what Rachel said, we saw that the fishing community, uh, for example, there was a, a situation where alcohol was provided by the boat owners to give courage to the fishermen to go and swim in very rough waters. So in that case, uh, also, we found that there was no, um, there was no, there, there was no facilities for people to, banking facilities. So 
it's just a recipe for ex if they have their cash with them and there's no banking facilities and also the fishermen also had um the the dependents each fisherman had about eight dependents each so this means that they have pressure to go and to go fishing in in very dangerous conditions so this shows that it needs a holistic approach and it just backs uh, um what all the speakers have said um today so thank you very much for this time